Praise the Lord and welcome to our 10 a.m. service here at Spirit Field Ministries where our senior pastor is Pastor Wayne D. Baker. Let's praise and worship together. Come on. Sometimes you have to encourage yourself. Sometimes you have to speak victory during the test and no matter how you feel speak the word and you will be healed speak over yourself encourage yourself in Gotta pat your own self on the back, yeah. Yes, oh. And no matter how you feel, speak the word and you will be healed. Speak all. Because 
He's my deliverer. He's my to redeemer. He's my protector. <laughs> yes. And he's never short of his word. But listen, speak over yourself. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on and receive the word of God from our senior pastor, Pastor Wayne D. Baker. Receive him as he comes in. Give God glory. Hallelujah. Good morning and welcome today to our broadcast uh, live stream and uh, visit our website. I'm so glad that we are in the process of uh, celebrating our 36th anniversary. 36 years God has kept us together. And let us be thoughtful, let us be prayerful, and uh, let us continue on. In 84, a group of people uh, went out, young people, we were, we were all young, and uh, we established the spirit field at that time, Methodist Church. So today, we are blessed, uh, overly blessed, in other words. Let us pray because God has brought us this far by faith and through faith we shall continue on. Father, we thank you for these 36 years of sometime hardship, mostly joy, uh, sometimes suffering, but all the time peace. For you have given us a peace that has passed all understanding. May we continue on uh, doing your will and carrying out your work as your servants. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now turn your Bible to Job. Job, the first chapter, the first 12 verses. I want to speak today on the subject, the invisible war. The invisible war. So get your Bible, turn your Bible to Job, first chapter and we will take uh, the first 12 verses, and sometime we may invade chapter two. Many of you who are gathered here this morning knows the reality of hardship. You know the reality of crisis, and you know the reality of tribulation. There's crisis all around us that we can plainly see, death on other hand. The government crumbling, people out of work, out of job. We see sickness, pain, sorrow, and widespread suffering. And I, let, let me remind you that it has been almost a year uh, since we have dealt with this coronavirus and are still dealing with it. The deaths that this pandemic has caused is atrocious. I think we're approaching now uh, about 230,000 and more today. They're dying at a rate of 1,000 uh, a day. And they tell us now that uh, by January or February, over 300 to 400,000 people will be dead. That's war. It has affected every country on the earth. Sometime through the foolishness, of our leaders, sometime through the action or inaction of individuals. This we all have seen, but there is an area of conflict that goes on all around us every day that we cannot see. This conflict that we cannot see is one that happens in the spiritual realm. You see, Job's battle was not uh, necessarily physical. It was not eyesight. You couldn't see it. But there was a battle going on behind the scene. Whether you know it, realize it, or accept it, the Bible is clear. We are engaged in spiritual warfare. In this war that we, we cannot see, there are many challenges, heartaches, struggles and 
disappointment. The Bible is clear on this. Let us, this Lord's Day, examine the area of conflict that goes on all around us. I ask that you turn your Old Testament Bible uh, with me to the book of Job, chapters 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. As I preach today on the subject of the invisible war. In this text, we are given only a small glimpse of the spiritual warfare that Job had to go through. We are allowed to see just enough of what he went through to remind us of the unseen warfare. Paul said in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, the 10th verse, we fight not against flesh and blood. A lot of time we think we're fighting against flesh and blood. A lot of time these neo-Nazis confront us and we think that we're fighting against flesh and blood. But oh no, my brothers and sisters, we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Uh, the book of Daniel tells us that there is an evil spirit, there is a demon that controls, has territories that controls the ungodly happenings in all regions. I believe that the whole world is divided up into regions in which there is a demon or a devil. By the way, uh, Satan had a right to come to heaven, you see, because he was the archangel. He was cast out of heaven. And uh, the sons of God came before their God. And Satan came with them. It is also in this text that we get to hear a little of what was said in heaven. That Job did not get to hear or know at the time he would encounter uh, this invisible attack. You see, had Job heard the conversation, God and Satan, his suffering would have been much easier to bear. But poor old Job, he did not know anything that was happening behind the scene. Had he heard the conversation between God and Satan, it would have been much easier for him to bear. Had he been more accepted than rejected, had he heard the conversation between God and Satan, he would have looked at his suffering in a different way. But Job knew none of these things. It's just like going to the ballpark. You slip into the ballpark and you can only get a, 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 a small glimpse of what is going on. And you hear the crack of the bat and the crowd roars. And you believe your favorite team has lost. And you get home, you're surprised that they won. You see, you see not everything in this life. And so we have a tendency to look at life uh, from a small view, a narrow view, because we don't know what is going on. My friend, when you are attacked, by the devil, there is something going on behind the scene. The battle is really behind the scene. It reminds me of Joshua and um, the, the guys who was beside him. And when they held up his hand, Joshua was out in the field fighting. Uh, Moses and Hur uh, was beside him, Aaron with the rod. They held up the rod and uh, Joshua won the battle. When Moses' got, hand got heavy and the rod uh, came down, they start losing. The battle then is not to the man out front. The battle is behind the scene, making intercession, praying to God. You fight an invisible war. It is when trials come our way, we often look at them in the wrong way. We are too quick to forget that God is behind it and standing with us and never leaving us. Remember, God said to the Apostle Paul, I will never leave you, neither will I forsake you. 
And we forget that Jesus Christ uh, is the same yesterday, today, and he will be the same forever in our lives. So what's going on now is happening in heaven. But I want you to know that God is in control of whatever it does. God changed things. God can give to you or to anyone else whatever he will. Everything belongs to God. I brought nothing into this world. And people, I will carry nothing out and neither uh, will you. We must never forget that behind all our pain that we go through, God is working out a better plan with his almighty hand. May the invisible war that Job went through be an encouragement uh, in the invisible war that you are going through or you are about to go through. There's help for you like there was help for Job. There are several observations in this text to take note of. First, we see an innocent man. Was Job guilty of anything like his uh, comrade accused him? Oh, no. Job was a man of purity. He was a man of integrity. He was a holy man. Uh, even he sacrificed for his children whom he said might have sinned. There was no sin a gal in Job, no proof of him sinning. He was a man in which no one could accuse him of doing anything wrong and no one had any proof that he lived a loose life. Not only was he a man of purity and integrity, Job was a man of wealth, great wealth. He had so many uh, asses, he had so many uh, donkeys, he had uh, so many cattle. Uh, the sheep was just atrocious what Job possessed. He was a man which no one could accuse him of anything. We know this to be true because he served as the family priest in his household. He loved his children mightily, and he always prayed daily for them. Like many, he was not a rustic Christian or who pretended to serve the Lord, but instead he was a polished uh, believer in tune with God every day, a holy example of righteousness for others to see and follow. I like uh, the 29th chapter, I believe, when Job went out, he was so respected that even older men stood up when he walked by them. And young ladies did their courtesy. Uh, and the sight of Job, Job was so holy that the sight of him, people would turn their head because they didn't want to look at him. That's how holy he was. So why? then would a man uh, like this be picked on by Satan? Had he sinned? No. Job didn't sin. Now, one thing we cannot do, we cannot lay everything to sin. Sometimes bad things happen to sinners, but I'm here to tell you today that bad things always happen to those who are in church serving the Lord. Someone told me, said uh, Pastor Baker, said, God took my mama and said, I want him, I'm waiting on him to tell me why. Well, that's a wrong picture of God. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, one thing happened to the sinner and the righteous and the wise alike. So we are all subject to the trials, the tribulations of this world. We gotta withstand them. One thing that the sinner do not have that we have is a God and an intercessor who knows and understands it. When I was at Moody, a professor uh, told me, I told him how much my mother had toiled and how little uh, she was rewarded. And he told me, he said, Baker said, uh, your mama will get back everything and even a trillion times more when she get to heaven uh, because God is no man's debtor. And I remember that, and I remember it now. God is no man's debtor. We trial, we, we, we're in trials on this earth. We're in tri travail on this earth. We're in tribulation on this earth. Because the Bible says, by much trial and tribulation, we enter unto the kingdom 
of heaven. This is exactly what Joe's friend believed about him. You, you look at Bildad, Eliphaz, and, and the other, are they accused, Job, have you been tipping out? I know something wrong with your moral life. I know something wrong with your spiritual life. One of the things I hate the most, uh, I've had some trials, people come up to me, uh, Pastor Becky, you must have sinned. Your, your family must have sinned. But it hurt me so, those accusations, when my daughter-in-law died uh, back in 2001, I got tired. I, I didn't want to go out and see people. Stop making pronostications on people's life, what they have done. Please, people, stop it. We suffer because of the cross of Christ. We suffer because our Savior suffered. We suffer because it is indigenous to our environment and indigenous to man to suffer. Even though we suffer from sin and making foolish decisions which can cause us many problems. And even though we suffer because of foolish decisions others make, in no way was this the reason for Job's suffering. Therefore, let us be reminded that no matter how close you are to the Lord, and no matter how much you worship, some people think by coming to church, worshiping God, that God protects them from suffering. Oh no. You know something? You're the very one who is most likely to be chosen for suffering. Now, did Satan choose a Job? No. Did Job volunteer himself? No. No one wants to suffer, not even me. But God chose Job because God knew that he was a man of integrity and he did it for his glory. Sometimes uh, we're always accusing the devil of doing something. It's not the devil. It's God. God is testing you. God is instilling some type of principle in you that he wants you to learn. Did the devil test Abraham? No. God tested Abraham because he knew that Abraham would remain faithful to him. And so we must keep in mind that sometimes the Lord tests us to build up and to grow our faith in him. But what is the greatest reason we suffer? The greatest reason we suffer is for the glory of God. Not only do we see an innocent man, we see also an invisible making. While Job is going about his business, his daily business, not bothering anybody. People, you don't have to bother anybody, but trouble will come. I, I don't care who you are. You can be, you can have great wealth, you can be in poverty, but to us who are experiencing these things, it seems like somebody is picking on us. God is picking on us. Well, God has chosen you to be uh, the glory of his calling. He's chosen you as a special piece to exemplify his glory. While he, he is still living close to the Lord, while he is still setting God examples in his home and in his community, there is an unseen war. It's going on right now coronavirus. It's going on with nation. It's unseen. Somebody behind uh, the scene is pulling strings. And there is an invisible making that is about to happen to Job that he knows nothing about. And hear me clearly when I say this invisible making didn't stop in Job's day. It's going on today, right down to the present time. In this invisible making, the angelic being makes an, um, uh, an appearance before the throne of God. The Bible says angels are ministering spirits which carries out the Lord's duty in heaven and on earth. It is now as they report back to the holy throne of God, saying the most important angel uh, before his great fall appears before the Lord. Now, I wonder sometimes, in, in my theological studies, 
Why is it that Satan had access to heaven? I mean, just think about it. what is Satan doing in heaven presenting himself uh, with the sons of God, the other angels? Well, that's a mystery. It's unknown. But I know one thing, if he is in heaven, uh, he's not there for very long because the Bible says the old serpent, the devil, the evil one, was cast out to the earth. And it also says, woe to the inhabitants of earth for the wrath of Satan is come down upon you for he knows that he has but a short time uh, to continue. Here it is the most ungodly, the most uh, dishonest, the most wicked, the most vile, the most uh, dangerous devil ever been come before the Son of God. When it comes to the devil, we must know who we are dealing with. We are dealing with the power of darkness. We are dealing with the adversary. We are dealing with the serpent, that murderer, the accuser of the brother, the power of death, the prince of this world, that soaring lion seeking whom he might devour, Peter said. The tempter tempted Jesus Christ the thief, the wicked one. That's who we're dealing with, folks. Do not play with the devil. When I was young, I believe I was, I had so much confidence in God. Uh, I, this is foolish. Don't let nobody fool you. I will always tell people I'm looking for a fight with the devil. As I am older now, uh, over 30, 40, almost 50 years of Christian, I want no pause of Satan. <laughs> I have had my desire, and many times Satan won uh, and appeared to win. I will never tell anybody that I'm looking for a fight uh, with Satan. But at that time, I was young. I didn't know any difference, and for him, God protected me. God protected me. And sometimes God will take our foolishness and bless it because we're immature. We don't know any better. People, the Bible says in Jude that even Moses, as holy as he was, did not dare uh, Michael the archangel, Michael the archangel, that Michael did not dare make a railing accusation against Satan. But guess what Michael said? The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. So use the name of Jesus Christ uh, to cover everything. The wicked names alone declare his character and who Christians are dealing with from day to day. In this invisible making, as Satan appear in heaven, his presence is known and seen by God. Now, uh, Satan began to accuse Job, uh, but God granted him limited authority over Satan. God told him, don't touch his body, don't touch his life, don't touch him. You see. Satan only exercises uh, his rights within limits and bounds that God has set. Somebody said, the, the Apostle Peter said, that uh, Satan is as a roaring lion. He may be a roaring lion without teeth because God, Jesus Christ, pulled his teeth on the cross. He's known on, on the earth as the accuser of those who committed to serving God. Uh, and I like this, he's an accuser. The Bible says that he accuses us before our great, awesome God day and night, but that's all he can do. The Bible says in Romans, who can accuse you? Who can condemn you? And the Lord Jesus let us know that nothing, but nothing, but nothing can ever separate us from his love. We know this to be true because when the Lord asked Satan, Yes, he considered his servant Job. Now, when you, uh, Job was so good that God bragged on him. When you like for God to, gra uh, to brag on you, uh, Wayne Baker is so good. You, I got a servant down there. If you're going to pick on somebody, I want you to try Wayne Baker. No, Lord, don't try me. <laughs> I'm not ready for the test. I don't think I am unless you give me the grace. 
But Job was so good that God and heaven bragged on him. People, that's a testimony. It's a testimony of his righteousness. It's a testimony of his love. It's a testimony of his devotion to the Almighty God. The first thing we should take note of is that God called Job his servant. Uh, when God asked Satan, have you considered my servant? For there's none like him. There was none like uh, Job in all the world. Servitude means more than a servant. It's a covenant relationship that you have with your great, awesome, mighty God. Listen to me carefully. Every true, born, uh, again, believer has a covenant relationship with God based on solemn oath. And the Bible says that when God, uh, when Abraham swore by God, uh, he could swear by none other. God swore on his own word that blessing, I will bless you. And that is an eternal oath. When you come to Christ, when you're baptized, when you're under covenant relationship, you enter certain blessings uh, from the Lord. This is to say when we accepted Christ into our lives, we were making a solemn oath. Uh, we were no longer belonging to the world. We had given up the world. We are now ambassadors of Christ. We are committed to serving God. And we no longer serve Satan. Just like business. So you see businesses in town? Uh, and they have, they closed. Why are you closed? Well, they open up a month or two later under new management. That's what happens when we are born again. Uh, we close down there. We're not uh, any longer under that old manager. We are under a new manager. New manager says that there's going to be a new beginning. That there, there is a, a new uh, fervor in the business. There's a new relationship with the customers. Uh, we're not going to do things the way we used to do them. The second important thing is to take note of is that Satan immediately tell God that Job's allegiance to him is because of what he gets from God. Now that's, that would be true. If you would come and pick on somebody today, why do you serve God? Do you serve him for the toys he gives you? Do you serve him for the blessings you receive him? Well, that's no reason to serve God. We serve God for what he is, his ontological nature of being, the essence of God being God. We serve him because he is worthy to be served within himself. There's no power, no knowledge, no being in this universe worthy of serving more than uh, God. Not even close. When it comes to Satan, we are dealing with an accuser. He accused Job of not being the godless servant God said he was. Now, if he accused Job, he accused him of hypocrisy. He said, take your fence around your famous boy, your boy that you love, and he'll curse you to his face. Well, we got to figure out, was Satan right or was God right? You see, the whole thing was God had bet. Let me, let me say bet for lack of a better word, uh, that Job would stand. And Satan was betting that if certain things were removed, that Job would fall. Who won? God won as he always will win. So now we come to an innocent man, an invisible making, an incredible madness. With all that is within his power, not holding back an inch of once, Satan unleashes hell in Job's life. That morning when Job woke up must have been hell in his life. His cow were gone. His donkeys were gone. His mules were gone. All that Job had was gone. But that's not the worst of it. He even killed 10 of his children through uh, 
tornado, a hurricane, or something that happened uh, spontaneously. But he left the men there to tell Job. It's as if Satan wanted to worry Job. And I heard my mama say, when it rains, it pours. It pours. Uh, so much that Job could do nothing but get some ashes, and that's the way they uh, vented their frustration in that day, and put on him and get naked and lay in those ashes. We notice in verses 16 and 18 that Job was bombarded with devastating news. One after the other, back to back, that this was no confidence. Satan spared those people so that they could go to Job and tell him of the disaster. Satan was sure that with such bombarding and awful news, Job would have nothing else to do with he, his creator, God, who made him, who he once served him, that he could stop them. That wasn't the devil's entire purpose. He wanted to break Job's spirit, and he also wants to break your spirit. He wanted to steal God's glory. Whatever it is that you are going through, don't let the devil break your spirit. In this COVID-19, my friends, don't let the devil break your spirit. Keep on believing, keep on having faith, Keep on having and putting your trust in God. As soon it will be over. I like the song that says, Trouble don't last always. No storm endures forever. The storm is passing over. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And as it passed over in Job's life, so will it too in your life if you keep the faith. Don't let him break your spirit. When it comes to your children, sometimes, I don't know about you, but some of my children I want to give up on <laughs> after you read Bill Cosby and uh, talk about taking them out. <laughs> I'm not talking about taking them out to dinner either. I'm talking about taking them out. I brought them into, th into this world and I can take them out of this world. No, that's no attitude to have. You just got to tolerate them and be with them and stick with them until their change come. When it comes to your spouse, don't let him break your spirit. My wife has been, and I have been married 46, 47 years, I've lost count. But anyway, when I was first married to her, I didn't understand, and I didn't understand women. Women are strange to understand, and, and so, but, I found in the last 15, 20 years, I would rather be married than anything else. My wife is my best friend. Uh, she is the strong one in the family. A lot of people look at me and think I'm the strong one. I'm not, I'm not the strong one. She is. She takes care of the children and maps things out and do almost everything in, uh, in the family. So I'm proud of her. So I will not let Satan break my spirit because of my spouse. Matter of fact, my love for her goes deeper and deeper every day of my life. I mean that. That's not preacher talk. It's my husband talk. Don't let him break your spirit when it comes to sickness or your health. I've been down and out, folks. I have uh, had uh, Valve put in my heart. I've experienced back trouble, back operation. I've had blood clots, two blood clots. One was in my heart, one going to my brain. And I'm as healthy today as a 72 year old man can be. I guarantee you that. Don't let him break your spirit when it comes to your finances. You may be going through financial difficulties. Don't let him break your spirit if you have gotten some bad news. Don't let Satan break your spirit. You see, what Satan does, this is in Revelation, that his idea of breaking your spirit is to wear you out. 
And some of us are worn out because we're doing things that is useless. It's all right to work in church. I believe people ought to work in church, but you can work in church so much that you can get bored. And I'm not sure that God did not bring this about. As a matter of fact, I knew he brought it about. I just don't know his purpose for doing it. But it could be to slow us Christians down and let us get back to the main thing. Whatever it is that you're going through a face at this very moment, in Jesus' name, refuse to allow him to break your spirit. Satan thought he had a great plan, but what he did not realize is that this was all God's plan to receive more glory from the righteous life of Job and to show the devil that the God of heaven is always in control. I like Romans, the eighth chapter. You see, evil serves the purposes of God because all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. God is in control, folks. Uh, if it could thwart God's plan, then God would not be God. I'll guarantee you that. But all things is working together. We can conquer it, but behind uh, everything, God is in the midst. He's keeping watch above his own. I want you to get two things from this message this morning. The first thing is that no matter how much we suffer and go through, we must always remember that God is in control with a divine purpose. The poet William Cowper said that God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He sets, he plants his footstep on the sea and rise upon the storm. In another verse, he said, his purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. In other words, you're going through, and while you're going through, you're not going to enjoy it, but the outcome. Folks, I look back over my life, and if it were not from God, even after I became a Christian, if it were not for God, I'd be a complete mess. I'd be a wreck. I would be dead in my grave. But the almighty, sovereign, gracious, omnipotent, omniscient, providential God, meaning that God has made a way for me from the foundation of this world, took care of me. And the same God will see me through. And the same God will see you through. He does this for every truly born again believer. From the beginning, this was all the plan of God. And Satan thought he was the one who was in control. But oh no, our Lord from heaven was in control. It's just like K. Ipas and Annas. Uh, one of those said that it's needful for one man to die. They didn't know what they were talking about. See, needful for one man to die. Christ died for all of us. They were looking at the nation in a my, uh, in a micro vision, but God was looking at the world with a macro vision. Bible makes it clear that the God of heaven the one who created man and the universe is the only one who is in control at all times. It is from this that I also would have you to understand that nothing happens in your life or in my life that is not a part of God's perfect plan for our lives and for his glory. He is control of the timing, his wisdom, uh, matches his knowledge and wisdom is nothing but rightly applying knowledge. An innocent man, an invisible maker, an incredible madness on the part of Satan. Now let's look at an intimate move. This is the fourth part and this is the last part. Verses 20 through 22. In the aftermath, 
of all that Job had been through and suffered and lost, he still had a testimony for the God he served. Well, someone said, if you don't stand the test, then you'll never have a testimony for God. Do you have a testimony of how you were in the fiery furnace? God did allow you to go through, but you came out and God got the glory. It is in this intimate mood, Job shaved his head, tore his garment, which he was never to do. This is commanded in the Old Testament. Don't tear your garment. To tear your garment means that you have given up. And so the people of God will warn not to ever tear their garment, their robe. But we are surprised that Job content to worship with all kind of devastating tribulation. In that moment when his world was turned upside down with everything that can go wrong. Now, what equivalency do we have today of uh, your world turned upside down? I want you to remember in the 96, I believe, I was in, uh, in Prada at a retreat, Moody Bible Institute sponsor. But I remember the stock market fell so many points and rich folks jumped off the Empire State Building and tall buildings and committed suicide. That was enough to bring Job to the brink of suicide. Did Job commit suicide? Oh no. He still trusted in his God. In that moment when the world was turned upside down with everything that can go wrong, with everything being against him, with everything taken away from him, with everything that could break his heart Throughout his worship, Job worshiped the Lord. He was able to bow down and worship the Lord because he took his eyes off the sorrow, the pain, the tribulation, the loss, the ones he loved, his children, and focused on God. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. When he speaks, he does not complain. When he speaks, he does not attack the Lord. When he speaks, he offers praise to the God of heaven. What a lesson for us to learn. Instead of complaining and griping about the little thing we go through. Sometimes there are saints who, if a, a little leaf fly on their head, they get mad. People, we're in a world of trouble. We're in a world of trials. We're in a world of tribulation. And these things must, needs be. Instead of, uh, and some will even quit the Lord. Uh, uh, some folks come here and they said, I'm gonna give them so many times to show so and so and so. I want to say, get the H out. Get out. You, you don't, you try and God, you, 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 no church is perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect church. Are you perfect? No. Certain things come with the territory. We must go through people. That's the message today. Go through, go through. Uh, God has reached out his hand to give you a helping hand and you can go through. You can come out of your fiery furnaces. You can come out of your lion's den. You can defeat your giants. You can defeat a hundred thousand men as Gideon did. If you go through with the Lord and allow him to lead you, hold his hand. Joe realized and understood that everything he once owned came from the hand of God. Uh, the other day I was talking to my wife. I said, honey, let's be thankful with what we have. Look at the people who do not have, uh, how happy some of them are. And here we are, we have a lot of things that God has given us or allowed us to have. Let us be thankful. If you got wealth that God has given you, if you got health, everything we have and all that we are is a product 
of the grace of God in our lives. So as I sum up today, like Job, there is an invisible war. Be, recognize that. You see, one of the things that God said, he said, watch as well as pray. We got to watch who's attacking us. We got to know whether it's of ourselves, uh, the devil, or God. If it's for God, go to it. Suffer with him, because glory is coming uh, later on. No matter the attacks, like Job, we will continue to trust, to praise, and to worship our great God. Our hearts are broken because we believe and know that the Lord is always on our side and will forever be our guide. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for the message today. I thank you for using your servant Job as an example. And Father, I praise you. All things are in your hand. Uh, this coronavirus is in your hand. The election is in your hand. Father, I will, and I've expressed what I would like, but nevertheless, you know more than I do because you see the ending from the beginning. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. To those of you in the audience, I pray that you have enjoyed the message today. By the way, the book of Job is a great book to read. Um, my professors told me that they didn't call the devil the devil in Job's day because the uh, theology of Satan was not fully developed. I believe that's true. But only Jesus brought it out in a way that we could understand it. Satan, the accuser, the devil uh, represents his evil character and the serpent represents his God. But be it known to you that there is someone behind the scenes who is always pulling the strings. And as someone is behind the scenes pulling the strings to make bad things happen, someone's also behind the scene keeping watch above his own. If those of you who would like to send a contribution to this mansion, we pray that you do. We're, we're celebrating our 36th anniversary. God has been good to Spirit Field in the years, the 36 years since we have been in existence. You can send your contributions by PayPal. You can send your contributions by mail, P.O. Box 12323, Columbus, Georgia. 31917, or you can bring them by the church from 10 to 6 o'clock. Remember to pray for this church. Pray for this ministry that our life on this earth will be longer than 36 years. Unfortunately, I may not be with you uh, during that time, but pray for the church that spirit filled will carry on and continue to do the work of the Lord. To my members, I want to say that his, it has been 36 wonderful years. It really has. 36 wonderful years. And I commend all of you. I thank all of you. All of you out in the audience out there, in uh, television land, radio land, who is not a member, but you consider yourselves a member. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you for your attentiveness. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, may he rest, abide, and be with you now henceforth and forever. Amen.